Acts chapter 20, and we will pick it up in verse number 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Love this verse. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I want you to think of someone. And I don't think you'll have any trouble. I think there will be someone come to your mind who fits this description. This individual, man, they live life to the fullest. Somebody come to your mind? They live life to the fullest. They milk everything out of every minute, every hour, every day that they are giving. They live life to the fullest. When I was thinking about this introduction, I... And my wife will relate to this. It was a lady that lived in the church that I, li or attended the church I previously pastored. Marie Matherly. And uh, I've heard Marie say so many times, I'm never going to get old. I am never going to get old. Now that's not to say that, and Maurice, she's getting up there. I'll be approaching 80. The last time I saw her, she's still abiding with that philosophy. It's not been that long ago. Now, has she slowed down some physically? Yes. She has. Can she do what she did a few years ago? No. But to her, getting old is a state of mind. And she refused. And is still refusing. Many of us have got to that point where we try to balance. I want to live by that, but my body's telling me something different. So there's a lot of us there. I love those people 
that their outlook on life is this. This is not just another day on planted earth. This is a day that God has given me. And I'm going to live it to the fullest for His honor and His glory. I think this text exemplifies a man who did that. The great Apostle Paul. He lived what I call a life worth living. That's what I want. Whatever time God has left for me on this earth, I want to live a life worth living. What is a life worth living? How can we break it down? I come up with some thoughts taken from this text. One of the first things that stood out to me was that a life worth living is a settled life. Now let's put ourselves into the text. Paul is going to Jerusalem. Obviously he feels the leadership of the Holy Spirit directing him to Jerusalem. Now there's a lot of discussion here. Because admittedly there's a verse in there where he says the Holy Spirit seems to be telling everybody else this is unwise. Remember, it's not been that long before this that Jerusalem had crucified Jesus. They had killed the Lord of glories because He had came, fulfilled his father's mission. They had not taken lightly to his message. The fact that his message was often very upsetting to the religious community. They hated him, quite frankly. Hated him so much that they wanted to see him die. When Jesus was taken before Rome, Rome wanted to satisfy him. After all, they found no fault in him. They wanted to satisfy the Jews. So they said, Let, let's beat him. How about that? We'll just take him out and beat him. Y'all can watch And the Jews cry out, no, no, that will not be sufficient. He must die. And eventually that's what happened. Now because of that, there is still a lot of hatred in Jerusalem for the people of God. They killed the Son of God, who just a few days later was very much alive and showed Himself alive. He went back to heaven and He left the work to the disciples. And we have the formation of the church. And they've carried on the work. They've carried the banner. So they hated Jesus and they hated those who aligned themselves with Him. Now Paul complicates things even a little bit more for them. 
You see, when we first read to him, he's not Paul, he's Saul. And he is a Jew of all Jews religiously. His lineage traces back, he's impeccable. He is a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He's right up here at the top of those who hated Jesus. On his way to Damascus, along the road, to gather more papers, to cause problems from the church, he was struck down. His face is in the dirt. And a voice out of heaven says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus says, and I believe that was Jesus speaking. He says, Saul, when you're persecuting those people, you're persecuting me. And you know the story. He was wonderfully, gloriously saved. I believe right there on that road. And immediately, he went to seminary, started preaching. There's still a hot bed of anger in Jerusalem for those who are of the way. They haven't been called the church yet. And Paul says, I've got to go back. I've got to go to Jerusalem. And those who love him and care for him are giving him what they think is the best advice they can give him. Paul, do you realize what you're walking into? They hate you because of the fact that you align yourself with Christ. They hate you even more Because of who you were. You were a part of them. You know what Paul said? He said, none of these things move me. I love that. None of these things move me. Whatever he may face. And I like to take that in just a very literal sense. I think Paul is saying that's not going to alter my course. I am on a course for Jerusalem. I'm not going to be moved. I shall not be moved. None of these things move me. What does that tell you? Here was a man who was very settled in his life. I've known so many people like that. They just kind of roll with whatever comes their way. And between them and God, they deal with it. Those are champions to me. Second thing I wrote down, a life worth living is not only a settled life, it's a surrendered life. He said in verse 24, The second part, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Paul learned something that we all should learn. A life worth living is one that's lived for our Lord and not for ourselves. Does that mean that every waiting moment of our life, the only thing we do is just focus on Christianity and Christian things and we never think about ourselves? No, I don't think so. No, I found out that God gives us plenty of time for ourselves. But our main focus at the top, when it comes down to between serving Christ And serving self, and that's what we do so many times. 
Christ is always to be number one. So as far as Paul is concerned, if going back to Jerusalem, and there's that potential, could cause me death, I'm willing to go. Because I have surrendered unto the Lord. He would write in Romans chapter 12, one of my favorite verses, I beseech you, literally means to beg. He's begging. I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living, here it is, sacrifice. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. There is no way that we can live for Christ the way we need to live for Christ if the focus is always on us. If the focus is on us on Thursday night, we'll stay home instead of going to visitation. We'll stay home. If it's about self, When we've worked, we're tired. If the focus is on self, we'll not involve ourselves in a Thursday night ladies' Bible study. I hope, I hope, by the way, that grows. I hope that that's just one. You know what I'd like to see out of it? I'd like to see out of that ladies' Bible study a men's Bible study. The same, the same concept, the exact things that Amber was talking about. And there's no reason why it can't. But if the focus is on self, we'll stay home. Paul could have said, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Everybody tells me this is going to be dangerous. Uh, I may lose my life. I'm just not going to go. He couldn't do that. Because his life was all about surrender. So a life worth living, it's a settled life. It's a surrendered life. And it's a satisfied life. He speaks of finishing his course with joy. Now remember, he is running the potential of finishing his course right here. He is heading into a minefield, literally. But he speaks of this work bringing him joy. Has Paul lost his mind? Has he turned into some crazed madman? He was accused of that, by the way, on numerous occasions. No. No. He was perfectly satisfied with doing the will of God. Satisfied. The great, great old hymn. And we sing many times. I love it. Serve the Lord with gladness. I think that was the heart of the Apostle Paul. It brought him joy. Even if the potential was there to lose his life, the joy that serving the Lord brought him was more important. It outweighed anything he may face. But let me give you one other thing. A life worth living, it's a settled life. It's a surrendered life. It's a satisfied life. It is a secure life. Look how he closes in verse 24. So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, watch, which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I can almost see That aged old apostle 
walking. That would have been the mode of transportation, walking in that arid, dusty locale, walking toward Jerusalem. I can see that. Walking toward Jerusalem, knowing what he may face, but he's walking fearlessly. Fearlessly. Now, let me say this. God does not want us to do foolish things. There are times that we should weigh matters and not do those things that are foolish. But here it is. And I'll leave you with this. If we know in our heart that God is leading us to be involved in something Go somewhere, say a word to someone, and we know in our heart that that's what God wants us to do. And we have these fears about doing that. We need to have the mind of Paul. Lord, I'm going to do it. Because you're going to pave the way. You're going to make the way. I'm going to share Jesus Christ with a family member that's lost. And there's a part of me that's very unsecure in doing that. But Lord, my security is in you. I'm going to trust that you're going to work on that heart. That you're going to touch that person. And they're not going to consider me as someone coming to them who's trying to be holier than thou. Lord, you're going to let that person's heart know that you love them and I love them. And I'm here to help them. I think that's what Paul was doing. He felt totally secure. As far as he was concerned, I really believe this. I think Paul felt, if I go to Jerusalem and they kill me, it's no big deal. This is in God's hands. Paul knew that ever what happened, he was a winner. Either way. Either way. Either way. Now let's bow our heads together.